Wizards for the first time this season when they faced them at the FedEx Forum tonight. Memphis won 121-113 on Monday night and lead the season series two games to none. Grizzlies star guard Ja Morant, who sat Monday with a sore right thigh, is not listed on the Grizzlies injury report tonight. Now the Spurs fought back from a 13-point second quarter hole Monday to lead by five in the fourth, only to lose. Something that we have to do to give ourselves a chance um, every single night, um, but it's something that you know we want to build on as well. Uh, we don't want to be a team that you know just depends on you know making shots and trying to play pretty and, and doing things like that. We want to you know be in there getting ugly, um, you know trying to be the team that plays harder every single night for all 48 as well. Here's the matchup for you: Memphis will host San Antonio tonight at seven. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Buffalo Bills safety Namar Hamlin was discharged from a Buffalo hospital this morning nine days after he suffered a cardiac arrest during the first quarter of Monday Night Football between the Bills and the Bengals. He was flown from Cincinnati to Buffalo on Monday where he passed a series of health tests and now he's able to continue his rehab at home and with the Bills. Grateful first and foremost that he's home and uh, with his parents and, and his brother, which is great. Um, I'm sure it's felt like a long time since he's been able to be home naturally there, and uh, I'm sure it's a great feeling. And yeah, we'll we'll leave it up to him. You know, his health is first and foremost on our mind as far as his situation goes. And then uh, when he feels ready, um, you know, we welcome him back as uh, as he feels ready. The Dallas Cowboys are getting ready to play at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as part of Super Wild Card Weekend Monday night at 7.15 right here on KSAT 12. Cowboys defensive lineman Demarcus Lawrence was asked why is seven-time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady so good in the clutch? I feel like, you know, in those situations, like, he can get his team ready, hurry him up to the ball and call his own plays because he, he know what type of defenses and stuff he's going to be facing. So, um, you know, respect to Tom Brady, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, we got to do our job. Tampa Bay won the AFC South at 8-9 for Brady's first losing season as a starting quarterback. His leading receiver, Mike Evans, ready to face the Cowboys passing defense that finished ninth overall in passing yards allowed. And before J.J. Watt's final game in the NFL last Sunday, the Arizona Cardinals played him a special tribute video that brought him to tears. Here's part of that clip that will air tonight on HBO Hard Knocks. They're down at corner. They got two guys injured. Um, that were some solid players. The, the, the backup is, is solid. We're watching more film on him, uh, 26. Um, he's made some plays, but um, you know when we're, when we're healthy, it doesn't matter who the DBs are. So I hope we, hopefully we get a lot of cover one. Uh, you know, I love that. Our apologies for that. Somehow our video got out of order. Evans had 71 yards receiving and one touchdown in the Bucks, 19 to three week one win at Dallas. And are we going to have that JJ sound? Hopefully we have it coming up. Brother, JJ, I just wanted to say congratulations on retirement. Um, you and your resiliency throughout all the ups and downs, you ending up in the NFL and you being a defensive player of the year and you having all the success that you had showed me that it's possible. Congratulations, buddy. See you in camp. You're an incredible player. Excited to see the next chapter of your life. Good luck, brother. Congrats on your retirement and Hall of Fame career, Jage. It's been so special having a front row seat to it all and I couldn't be more proud of you. Love you, bro. His wife and both of his parents are also part of that video, and he cried a lot, which was obviously awesome. did not expect it. He did not. It surprised him. Yeah, the NFL is going to miss him. They will. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. Well, former Uvalde CISD Police Chief Pete Arredondo still not talking about what happened during the catastrophic response to the deadly shooting at Robb Elementary, but he did talk the day after the shooting. Yeah, what he said to investigators about that response or lack of it, and what body cam shows actually happened during that response. The full story is next. For the first time, the former Uvalde School District Police Chief, in his own words, talking about the decisions he made the day of the Robb Elementary School shooting. CNN got video of the interview with Pete Arredondo. It was recorded the morning after that shooting, with Arredondo speaking to the FBI and Texas Rangers. CNN's Shimon Praukopez takes a closer look. 
I know there was probably victims in there. And with the shots I heard, I, I know it's probably somebody who's going to be deceased. Former Uvalde School Police Chief Pete Arredondo heard for the first time. Careful, Chief. Come on, come on. The day after the May 24th shooting, attempting to explain his actions. In new video obtained by CNN, Arredondo telling investigators he assumed students in the room with the shooter were already dead. So he chose to clear children from surrounding classrooms. There's nobody in there? No, not here. It's clear. We now know he was wrong. At least three victims were pulled out of the room alive, who later died from their injuries. My first thought is that we need to we need to vacate. We haven't been we haven't contained, and I know this is horrible. I know this is what our training tells us to do, but we haven't contained. There's probably gonna be some deceased in there, but we don't need any more from out here. So I called out and I said, "Get these kids out." Okay, Whatever I told them, bust those windows, get them out. Stunning admissions while being questioned by the FBI and Texas Rangers. Uh, Throughout this deal, I was trying to get make communication with him. He's communicating. Can you hear me, sir? Arredondo explains he kept trying to talk to the shooter, and for the first time, we learned that he heard the gunman, alone in a room full of children, reloading his weapon. And still, he took no action that stopped the gunman. I'm certain I heard him reload. I, I heard something over the pin. You obviously well know what that sounds like. Uh, not with a pin, I'm sorry, with a, with a clip. I'm assuming he reloaded, but I know he did something with it. Uh, I did hear that at one time. I don't know if it, there was a second. Um, he never responded at all. I'm gonna go around that way or, what, or which way? Now considered one of the worst law enforcement failures in recent memory, Arredondo knew that criticism would come. We're gonna get scrutinized, I'm expecting that. Uh, we're gonna get scrutinized, why we didn't go in there. Days later, Arredondo would be labeled the incident commander by the Texas State Police. They say he was the officer in charge and the man to blame for the deadly delay. Who was the incident commander, sir? The chief of police of the Consolidated Independent School District is the incident commander. It's his school, he's the chief of police, okay? Arredondo, who presided over a six-person police force before he was terminated in August, declined to comment for this story. Through his lawyer, he has previously denied that he was ever in charge and said he never issued any orders. A CNN analysis of never-before-made public body camera footage and newly obtained phone calls reveal Arredondo repeatedly directed the officers around him not to enter the room with the gunman. This is at 11.40 a.m., just seven minutes after the shooting began. Hey, hey, this is Arredondo. This is an emergency right now. I'm inside the building. I'm inside the building with this man. He has an AR-15. He shot a whole bunch of times. He is in one room. I need a lot of firepower, so I need this building surrounded. I need to surround it with as many AR-15s as possible. As more officers with body cameras responded to the scene, we can hear Arredondo start to talk to the shooter. Sir, this is Arredondo with the school district police. Can you please put your firearm down? We don't want anyone else hurt, sir. Arredondo can be seen trying to open the door to an adjacent classroom while giving commands to other officers. We're, we're going to clear out before we, before we do any reach. We're going to clear out these guys. And since I clear this room, I'm going to verify what's been vacated, guys, before we do any kind of reaching. Time's on our side right now. Time was not on his side, and it reflects a mindset that goes directly against active shooter training. The policy emphasizes speed for any officer to go immediately towards the sound of gunfire and stop the shooter. Arredondo last completed the training in December 2021, five months before the Uvalde massacre. At about 12, 12 p.m., a crucial transmission from the Uvalde dispatcher comes over the radios in the hallway, informing the officers that a child in the room with the gunman called 911 and says she's surrounded by victims. The dispatch blares with an earshot of Arredondo. He doesn't seem to hear it because he's talking, repeating instructions for officers not to enter. Hey guys, hold on. We're going to clear the building first, and then we'll attack the officers actually turn down their radios so they can hear Arredondo give the order. Actually, turn the radios down, please. It seems clear to the men on this side of the hallway Arredondo is in charge. No 
entry until the chief of police gives you permission there. And when a nearby officer suggests that a Border Patrol agent looks like they are about to go in. You ready for friendlies? No, no, wait, no, nobody no, entry. Arredondo said he assumed Border Patrol agents at the other end of the hallway would be the ones to make the breach, since they had rifles and he and his men only had pistols. Uh, so I know those are BP and I know those are probably Bortac. Uh, smart thing for us to do, obviously with a handgun, is we need to let these guys uh, make entry when that's, when it's that time. I gotta go over <laughs> But it wasn't just handguns. As body camera footage clearly shows, there were plenty of heavily armed officers on scene. Hey, some in the very first moments after the shooting began. Arredondo, for the first time, also explaining why he thought the door was locked, admitting he never tried to open it. I have it in my, my picture in my mind that I saw that. I saw that hammer in there. And usually when that's there, that's locked. Man, 90% of the time. We now know investigators believe it was unlocked and there was no need to wait for a key. At the end of the interview, Arredondo says that rather than breaching the door, he even considered trying to shoot through the walls to kill the gunman. The thought crossed my mind to start shooting through that wall, which has been stupid, but you, you start thinking, there's already somebody deceased in there, uh, you want to start, but you know, obviously we, we don't ever train to shoot through walls, it's not something that... Uh, it's not probably the smartest idea, but, you know, you always question yourself. Shimon Prokopez, CNN, Uvalde, Texas. You can find a link to the full interview video, all 57 minutes of it, on KSAT.com. Just look for this story. We'll be right back. Delays and cancellations grounded thousands and thousands of air travelers across the U.S. this morning after the computer system that all pilots must access before each flight crashed. The incident still affecting people's arrival and departure times, but things currently appear normal at San Antonio International Airport at last check. According to the FAA, its computer system called the Notice to Air Missions or NOTAM went down last to excuse me went down late Tuesday impacting some 21,000 domestic flights scheduled for today most of them this morning the system alerts pilots to potential risks they may encounter during their flights before they took off federal officials are now investigating to determine what caused that system to go down another look outside this evening we're getting closer to the arrival of that cold front and the wind Adam. Yeah, the wind's going to be the big headline, I think, tomorrow. Now, the cold front's going to hit at midnight, but it's not going to be a drastic cold front that you notice right away. Nothing like that cold snap we had around Christmas. We're 77 right now. By midnight, down to 60 degrees. That's when the cold front hits. And tomorrow morning, 54 at 6 a.m. So clearly not a huge temperature drop immediately with this front. But there will be some even colder mornings. We'll talk about that, how cold it's going to get, and how much really the temperatures will drop and how close it is to average in just a little bit. We got some changes just around the corner, but sounds like they're going to take a little while to settle in once that cold front gets. Here. Yeah, kind of break down the timing for us, Adam. Yeah, well, I mean, you think about it, too. We're going from 70s and 80s, right? So unseasonably warm, almost record challenging temperatures back down closer to where we should be this time of year. The cold front it's going to hit at midnight. But you're not going to notice it right away. Not one of those kinds of cold fronts we will drop down near average for about the next three days, especially when it comes to high temperatures. But temperatures remaining above freezing we will have some cooler mornings, but we're not expecting Arctic air with this front. Take a look at the temperatures across the state and that cold front. It's starting to move its way eastward. Clearly not a massive temperature drop along it. Near 80 in Junction, 73 Abilene, you get behind the front, 60s, and then even some 50s up in the Panhandle. Locally, 72 in Holotus, Canyon Lake at 70, Seguin now 75, and officially in town we're at 77. Tomorrow morning, we'll wake up to readings in the lower 50s, so nothing frigid out there, and actually about 10 degrees above average for this time of year. So 53 in the morning around San Antonio, some upper 40s in the Hill Country, and then by tomorrow afternoon, 
We're into the mid 60s locally, about 66 around San Antonio officially and a little bit cooler as you get into the hill country, but the average high is 63. So we're a little closer to average, but still a bit above it. Mid 60s Thursday and Friday, upper 60s on Saturday, and then by Sunday, we're well into the 70s again, and that's where we're going to be through or as we get into next week as well. So this is going to be a brief little reset in terms of temperatures. Wind, that's going to be a big story. Calm right now. Don't even notice the breeze outside. That's going to be changing significantly. Behind the cold front, by sunrise, the wind will really start to pick up. We're talking a steady north wind around 20 miles per hour with gusts in excess of 30 miles per hour. Now this computer model we have here is saying wind gusts 7 a.m., 10 a.m., 38, 39 miles per hour. That may be a little excessive, but definitely within the, within the realm of possibility. And then after sunset tomorrow, the wind will start to pump the brakes and simmer down just a little bit. I wish we could drum up some rain, some moisture with this cold front, but it's just not going to happen. You see the swirl here in Kansas coming out of Colorado. This is a classic Colorado low that develops from the cross barrier flow from the 500 millibar of vorticity. <laughs> we can get all into it and you get the uh, the Lee cyclogenesis forming. Uh, just having a little fun here, but it's true. And then it develops the cold weather front geeking weather geeking, weather out. geeking out. out. Yes, I love on my <laughs> forecast sheet when I get to write Lee cyclogenesis exclamation point. Don't we all? Mm hmm. Good stuff. Sometimes we get that even here in Texas. We get that lease cyclogenesis. Anyway, that's moving eastward and that's going to carry its energy away from us and not really impact our conditions in terms of rain. Big story still West Coast. You know, parts of California have had up to three times their annual average rainfall just within the past week. That's how significant this is. You see this big atmospheric river coming on shore. And we're still learning a lot about these atmospheric rivers. They're, we don't have a whole lot of knowledge about them. So in particular, NASA's even doing some research. Hurricane hunters are flying into those atmospheric rivers so we can really learn more about them. Uh, they're, I'd say, a relatively new phenomena that's being studied in more detail now. But those atmospheric rivers, big plume of Pacific moisture coming on shore. It's going to continue to pound the West Coast. Look up and down the midsection of the country over the next seven days. Pretty dry, dry conditions up and down the central portion of the country. You get to the coast and that's where the action is. 10% chance of rain by Wednesday of next week. If I'm generous, I'd give it a 20%. That's about where we stand right now, unfortunately. The wind, the big headline tomorrow. Here's your case at 12 hour forecast, 53 degrees at 7 a.m. By noon, we're sunny up to 62. And then by four o'clock, we're hitting 66 for the high temperature. Coldest mornings, uh, Friday at 38 and then Saturday down to 35. In the hill country, we could have a brief light freeze those mornings, but I think around town and most of us uh, outside of the hill country will be just above freezing. But of course, that's a return to jacket weather at the bus stop those mornings. And there's that only 10% chance next Wednesday at this time. You know, Cyclogenesis was a big band in the 80s, weren't they? <laughs> Phil Collins <laughs> played drums and sang for him, I think. Yeah. What about Lee Cyclogenesis? I don't know. We never know. Still a big 80s band. In case you missed it. <laughs> Here's today's In Case You Missed It. It is Wednesday, January 11th. Two San Antonio teenagers arrested for breaking into cars and le been leading officers on a chase. This happened Tuesday morning in New Braunfels. This is one of the suspects, Joe on help one day. Police say he and two others were reported for forcibly breaking into cars in a shopping center near I-35. When officers got there, the suspects took off in a gray car and then led officers on that chase. But two were eventually caught, a 16-year-old male and Puente. A third suspect was not caught. A woman arrested for stabbing a man four times during an argument. This is Loretta Appelt. She's charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Arrest records state on Monday Appelt and a man were arguing over her sister. At some point, Appelt reportedly pulled a knife and stabbed the man's head and neck. He was taken to University Hospital. Appelt later arrested her bond set at $100,000.
Americans could soon be paying out of pocket for the COVID-19 vaccine and boosters. Vaccine maker Moderna said when the government contracts end, it's considering charging between $110 and $130 per dose. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. In an interview, Moderna's chief executive officer said, quote, pricing is consistent with the value of the vaccine. Another vaccine maker, Pfizer, said it's also looking at charging about the same price per dose. This year's Coachella lineup is out. The music festival's promoters tweeted a picture of the lineup poster yesterday. Headliners include Bad Bunny, Blackpink, and Frank Ocean. Variety reports Coachella has been trying to feature more international artists and that the lineup reflects that. Coachella is scheduled for April in Indio, California. Main headline with this cold front that hits tonight, the wind tomorrow. Steady at about 20 miles per hour for a good portion of the day and then gusting up to 35 at times. So you'll, you're going to notice the wind and that's likely to boost the mountain cedar count for tomorrow and even lingering into Friday. Sunny all day tomorrow. We'll start off in the lower 50s by the afternoon. We're at 66. 60s for highs through Saturday, closer to average, but still a little above. And then we warm back up again. Tissues handy tomorrow and Friday. Yeah. Jacket. Yeah. Allergy pills have them handy as well. <laughs> Thanks for watching. See you tonight on the Night Beat at 10.